Okay, well, it's Wednesday night. This is Impact Wednesday night, and I'm going to try not to start off really soft like some pastor I heard here a while back is starting off and I'm going to this, and they end up screaming and hollering, okay? Some views there, Mike, you saw. <clears throat> it's a great funeral, okay? <laughs> but I want to talk tonight about a few things that are on my heart. Impact Wednesday night, we normally deal with situations that are going on in people's lives, questions that have been asked. Uh, normally, we, we, we dive into those uh, different topics. And tonight, I just, I sincerely want to talk about our prayer life. We've been going over this for a few weeks now. And if we were to take a moment to look at a few places in Scripture that talk about prayer, I want to talk about two specific subjects of prayer, i.e. our personal prayer life and our public prayer life. Okay, did you find what I was looking for? Gotcha, gotcha. So, in Luke... Chapter 11, starting at verse 1. It says, And it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, when ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today, give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Now this is the Lord Jesus teaching his disciples to pray when they asked. Amen? So I want to flip back to Matthew chapter 5. Okay? There's a reason I'm doing this because Jesus addresses prayer in Matthew 5 on the Sermon on the Mount and he does it in several different ways. He does personal prayer life and how we're supposed to pray in our personal prayer life. Okay? And then he also addresses the Lord's Prayer at the same time. Okay? So in Matthew 5 starting at verse 5, it says when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the huh? In Matthew five? That's not Matthew five five. Or Matthew six five. Oh. My bad. I did a Kyle, didn't yeah. I? We're calling the Kyle from now on, okay? I did a Kyle. Matthew six five. Okay, Matthew six verse five. Mike was having a, a uh, moment, a T moment. <laughs> Yeah, T for the starting of someone's name. <laughs> uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Excuse me. Matthew 6, verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogue and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as heathens do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore likened unto them, for your heavenly Father knoweth the things that you have need of 
before ye ask him. After this manner, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, we see here Jesus addressing personal prayer. There's an attitude about personal prayer that you have to have. It's not about boastfulness. It's not about pride. It's not about many words that you cry out to God with that he's going to hear you because this act of prayer is some kind of religious activity that gets you anything from God. The point that Jesus is making here about going into your closet is this is a personal thing. That you're wanting to be intimate with your Heavenly Father. This is what prayer is about. Amen. Being intimate with God. Having time set aside where I can be intimate with God. Personal prayer time is important. Now if you will, let's go to Luke chapter 18. This is the Pharisee and the publican. This is the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. And this is an act of prayer that's being done openly. Amen? This is an open, active, openly done prayer at the temple, at synagogue, at church, if you will. Amen? And he spake a parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. I want you to get why the parable is being told. Amen? Watch this. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, an extortioner, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not even so much as lift his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalteth himself shall be abased, and the one that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Two things that I want to point out about public prayer. Number one, public prayer, if it is all about you, then you should be doing that in your closet. And if your public prayer is done out of an attitude of, look at me, God, look at my stuff, look at how good I've been for you, God, right? This is the attitude Jesus is addressing, is it not? Because they were trusting in themselves. Amen? Our public prayer life ought to be a, a public prayer life should be one of contrition. Should be one of, woe is me God for I am not worthy. Amen? Public prayer should never lift you up. It should lift God up. It should... It should see God as high and lifted up the source, the power, the, 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 the only help in my time of trouble. Yet so often churches, 
church's prayers and people in church, their prayers sound something like this. Lord, help your servant. We're out here doing your will. God, we are ever working for your kingdom. And we're out here walking in the gifts and the callings that you've given us, God. And look at us. Rather than, woe is me, be merciful to me, sinner. Which prayer lifted God up and which prayer lifted man up? Look, it even tells you that this man prayed with himself. It doesn't even say he was praying to God. It just said he prayed with himself. Amen? So his whole focus was about him. Amen? Now, can I tell you that neither one of these actually follow the model of, you know, the Lord's Prayer. But the attitude found in the second man, where he is humbling himself, is where we all must get now I spent last night, this morning, and much of today being concerned, prayerful. I'm troubled in my heart for people in our church. I'm troubled in my heart for people that are in our church or who can't come to church or are going through some very difficult circumstances because so often what we tend to do in circumstances such as this is we start lifting up our circumstance as if the circumstance dictates how I feel about God. Amen? Now, you're going to go, well, this doesn't have anything to do with prayer, but I'm going to show you that it truly does have something to do with prayer. Because my attitude in prayer, if it is all about me, if it is about God, if you do this for me, I'll believe in you. Because that's what we actually do when we're praying a certain way. God, I need you to show up in this situation. I need it to work out this way. And then when it doesn't work out that way, we go, well, God must be punishing me, or God must have forgotten me, or God must not be in this situation. Did God hear my prayer? Is God listening to me? Right? So often, look, I'm looking at an empty room. Practically empty compared to where we want to be, where we think we should be. Amen? I'm worried about people who are apathetic and who are not coming to church, who are not giving or not showing up for the things that we're doing. And I'm worried about people who are going through very trying circumstances. And I'm praying earnestly for all these things. But if I start letting what everything look like dictate how I feel about God or what God's doing, or that somehow God is failing me. Then I'm no longer walking in faith. And my prayers are not being prayed the right way. You see what I mean? If I'm praying as if God is not listening to me. If I'm praying as if God doesn't hear me. If I'm praying as if God is against me. As if God is my enemy. And somehow I have to pray a certain way so that I can get God on my side. I can tell you from the moment you started praying that way. You're not praying biblically. Anyone who comes to God must first believe that he is. And anyone who believes that he is and comes to God must believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. How about some Bible verses that say that God is for us 
and not against us. How about some Bible verses that tell us that we can set our affection on God, on things above, set our hope on Christ. Amen? How about Bible verses that say that we've been granted a new and a living way that is unhindered to the very throne room of God, that we can come boldly before the throne of God and receive grace and mercy in our hour of need. So many times Christians let their prayer life turn into a, 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 a pity party that says, God, you forgot me. Here I am, forgotten God. Why have you forgotten me? Why have you left me? Why have you forsaken me? Do that sound like faith? Does that sound like they're understanding and leaning on God's word? It sounds exactly the opposite. It doesn't sound like they're leaning on God's word because God's word says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Amen. He says, I'll go with you in the flood and in the fire. I'm going to go with you. I'll be, your, I'll be your standard out front. I'll be your rear guard. Amen. He said, fear not for I am with you. But so often Christians do not pray like God is with them. Amen? Look at what Jesus said. I want to go back here to Matthew chapter 6. Chapter 6. Okay, make sure everybody heard me. Chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Flip back there real quick. I want to show you this. <clears throat> Be ye therefore not like them. This is verse 8. For your father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask. Here's the thing, brother. Here's the thing, sister. If God knows what you have need of before you ask, doesn't the logical conclusion mean that God has a plan to give you uh, an expected outcome? Amen? And look, look, it may not be a Lamborghini. Okay? Camaro. Huh? Camaro. Or a Camaro. But God has a plan. And he's going to work out his plan according to his will, according to his purpose. Prayer is not, I go to God and rub a lamp like a genie and get what I wish for. That's not prayer. Prayer is intimacy with God first and foremost. It is absolutely intimate communication between God and you. That's prayer. The purpose of prayer is so that you can discover God's will. Not so that God can meet your will. That's the purpose of prayer. Now we're going to go to Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm going to give you this because this is very important when we want to pray right. Okay? How many of you want to pray with the right heart, the right attitude, the right understanding? Amen? So if we're going to pray right, we need to get this settled in our heart. Amen? Romans 8, and we're going to start at verse 28. When you get there, say amen. amen. Romans 8, 28. And we know. I want to stop right there. And we know. Who's the we? Those who are in Christ. Those who have been called. Those who have been elected. Those who have believed. Amen. Those are the we. So if you're a we, this is something you need to know. Amen? If you're a we, if you're part of God's family, if you're one of the elect, if you have believed, if you've come to faith in Christ Jesus, if you're born again, this is the we. You're part of the we, and you need to know this. And when I say you need to know it, I don't mean you have, need to have a head knowledge of it. You need to have a heart knowledge that says, I know this deep down inside of me 
I know that this is true. Okay? I'm going to show you why it's that emphatic when we get towards the end of this. Okay? But Romans 8, 28. For, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and to whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, he, he goes through this uh, a, a golden chain, they call it, okay? This is the golden chain of redemption, okay? There's an election, there's a choosing, there's a calling, there's an answering, there's a justification, there's a glorification, and it's all God. God is the one that's calling, God is the one that's redeeming, God is the one that's saving, God is the one that's pulling us out of the darkness and putting us in the light. God is the one that's waking us up from the dead and bringing us to life. This is God. Amen? Amen. So he asks a question when he's done reminding you that God is the one who saved you. He asks the question, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. It is God that justifies. Amen. Can we say that again? It's God that justifies. I'm not justified by my works. I'm not justified by how righteous my prayer sounds. I'm not, I'm not justified by how good or eloquent or how much I speak. I am not justified by any of that. I'm justified by faith in God and His promise in Christ. That's the only way I'm justified, by God. My justification is by God. Who is it that can, who is He that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who is also making intercession for us. I want you to understand that when you're praying, Christ is praying for you on your behalf. He's interceding before God for you. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. If any man be in Christ, he's heir, joint heirs to the promises of God and Abraham. Amen? Can we get it in our mind that once we're called, once we're elect, once we're born again, we're children of God, according to Scripture. And God will never, never, never leave those that are part of His family. Watch this. Who is it that condemneth? It is Christ who died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who is also maketh intercession for us. Who, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation? Who, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Excuse me. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. I want to. I want to. I want to. want to just let you in on a little secret here. This doesn't just say if you're suffering for righteousness' sake. It doesn't even say uh, shall suffering for the gospel separate. Shall this? It's not even talking about any of that, is it? It's talking about regular earthly problems. Look at what it says. It says, shall tribulation, shall distress, or persecutions, or famines, or nakedness, or perils, or swords. It shouldn't matter to you. Do you understand that not 
even uh, 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 jail cells, not even not even uh, homelessness, not even anything. None of it can separate you from God. So whatever God allows you to go through, God has a purpose. He said already in verse 28, He works all things for the good of those who love Him and are called. Are you called? Do you love God? Then He's working for your good in every situation. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Notice that we are only more than conquerors through Christ. You're not a conqueror all by yourself. You will not, be con you will not conquer anything by yourself. It must be through Christ. Because he has overcome the world. Amen. Amen. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives, give I unto thee. Amen. Fear not, for I have overcome the world. For I am persuaded. And I told you we were going to get here. Not just know it in my mind. But I know it deep down inside of me where I am fully persuaded. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know, I was asked a very pointed question this week. How do I... How do I feel like God has not left me? The true answer to that question is, you're never always going to feel like God's right there. Because God being in your life is not a feeling. God being in your life is a reality. That you're going to, you're not always going to feel this way because you're going to be in persecution. You're going to be in peril. You're going to be in distress. You're going to be in these things. And, and when they come, this is where your test, the, your faith is tested. Whether you really believe or you only want to believe when things are going good. Because there's a difference. True faith holds on to Christ no matter what. Saving faith will never be destroyed in the midst of trial and struggle. It will be strengthened. It may be tested. It may be tried. It may be warmed in. But it will come out the other side 100% stronger, tried, true, tested, genuine faith. You want to know when you can tell that you don't have genuine faith? When you give up in the middle of all of it. Now believe me, as a pastor, there's plenty of times when I feel like giving up on all kinds of things. But I'm telling you this. God's word catches me every time. Because I believe this. And I pray like I believe this. What does it mean to pray like I believe Romans 8, 28? I pray like God is still working in my situation. No matter how it looks, no matter how terrible things get, no matter how people are treating me, no matter how uh, I'm treating others, no matter how things are going, God's still at work no matter what. And when it's all said and done, I go to God and I say, God, I thank you for working in my life. I thank you that you're working all things for my good. And I know that no matter how I feel right now, no matter how I feel tomorrow, I know that you're working all things for my good, that you're always working all things for my good, that I might be one of those who are conformed into the image of Christ. And I know that neither height nor death, angels, principalities, my feelings, my circumstances, 
They won't separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. There's something that we miss so much in the Lord's Prayer, and I'm going to close with it. I'm going to go back to Matthew 6. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we understand a few things. Number one, we understand we're praying to our Father who knows what we have need of before we even ask. Amen? Amen. Isn't that the verse before that? Verse 8. And then he says in verse 9, after this manner, pray ye, our Father, our Father who? Our Father God, who's in heaven, who already knows what I have need of before I ask it. That Father who, who is not like us wicked men who give good gifts to our children, how much more will he give us the Holy Spirit if we ask? This Father, our Father, who knows us, who loves us, who counts the very hairs on our head, who has the number. You understand when he says he has the hairs of your head numbered? That doesn't mean he just knows how many they, that are there. That means if one of them falls out, he knows what number fell out. Our Father who takes care of the birds, the air, and the flower of the field, who loves us and cares for us and wants to take care of us. When we pray, Our Father, we pray that. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We lift up your name. We lift up who you are because we know that you have made us. We know that you have called us. We know that it is you who saved us and justified us. Everything Romans 8, 28, 29, and 30 says that God does in that golden chain of redemption. We know that God does all those things. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. You see, there's too many Christians praying for their own kingdom, for their own will, for their own way. Amen? Amen. And it's not God's will, and it's not God's kingdom that they're wanting to establish, but their own. I'm praying earnestly that God's will be done in us, in this church, that his kingdom would be established in the hearts of in the minds of everyone in this church. And that should be your prayer. When you pray. When you go to God. When you understand Romans 8.28. All the way through the end of the chapter. When you know that nothing separates you from God. You can come to God. With a humble and contrite heart. And say God here I am a sinner. Unworthy of being in your presence. But I know that you're my father. Because you've called me. You've redeemed me. You've justify me. You're going to glorify me. So I come and I come understanding that you're ready to bring your kingdom and establish it in me. Your will, let it be established in me. Give me today my daily bread. The things that I have need of, the graces, the mercies, the blessings, the, the instruction, the correction that I need today. Give me my daily bread. Forgive me of my trespasses, my debts. Forgive me where I fall short. Forgive me where I mess up. Forgive me where I overstep. Forgive me where I'm not as loving and as kind and as caring as I should be. Lord, forgive me and help me to forgive others. Lead me not into temptation, God. Keep my eyes and my heart and my hands and my feet from evil. Deliver me from evil. And I know this may not be part of the original text, but it still sounds really good. For thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power and thine is the glory. Number one, we are seeking to establish God's kingdom and we are praying earnestly that it happens. And there's only one way it's going to happen. Because it's not by might nor by power, but by his spirit.
Amen. Amen. It's by God's power and not my own. Yours is the glory forever and ever. I don't know who this is for, but I'm telling you, God's not done. God doesn't rest. He doesn't sleep. He's not on his throne nodding off. He's not an innocent bystander in your life that might step in every once in a while to do something important and then just let everything else go on as it pleases. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is intimately involved with your salvation from beginning to end. He's the author and he's the finisher of your faith. He, is, he establishes every step. The days of our life are written down before one of them is lived. That's what the Bible says. The days of our life are written down before any one of them has ever lived. Man makes his plans, but the Lord establishes his steps. It's God that's willing and working in you to do and to will according to his good pleasure. Amen. When we pray, we should pray with that understanding that God has never left me. He's never forsaken me. He's never gonna, he's never gonna do anything for my bad. He's not out for the, my, my destruction, but for my benefit, for my good. If you're a child of God, God is not against you. He is for you. If you're a child of God, Yes, God may allow you to go through circumstances that are very trying. He may allow you to go through some sickness and some diseases that are very trying. But God's working all things for your good. Amen. And you have to know that. You have to know it deep down. You've got to be like Paul, fully persuaded that this is true. And if it is, it'll change your prayer life. Now tomorrow you may wake up and you may have a, a really tough day. And you may have to remind yourself just like I'm reminding myself right now because I had a really tough day that God's still working all things for my good. That he's still working all things for this church's good. That he's still working all things for Kyle's good and Carmen's good and Mike's good and Tristan and Becca's and, and Colt's and, and, and Kevin's and, and Becca's and and, and, and Hadassah's and Matthew hiding behind the wall. He's still working all things for our good. Still working all things for the good of every person we can name that comes to this church. Who names the name of Christ. Who are born again believers. God is not against you. God is against the sinner and the reprobate. The Bible says so. He's against them. They're enemies. They're at odds with each other until they're born again. Period. End of story. But when you're born again, God is no longer your enemy. God is no longer against you. God is actively involved in changing you and molding you and shaping you into the image of his dear son. God, you must believe that. You must. God is not against his people. He is for them. For their good. For their benefit. For his glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father God. We come to you tonight God. Burdened. For those in our church. Who are struggling. God burdened for those who in our church are struggling with circumstances that are out of their control. Those who are, uh, are burdened with, with sin. Those who are burdened with the, the troubles of life. Lord, we are burdened with thoughts and, and, and prayers for those who are far off from our congregation who have not been here in quite a while, God. We labor in prayer and, and 
talk to them every moment, every chance we get, God. But we need you to work in their heart and in their life, God. We are so concerned for them. We, we care for them and we long to see them again, God. Lord, we pray for those in our church who are in desperate need of hearing this message. That their ideas and their thoughts that you are against them and that you're, you're actively working against them, Lord. And that, that Lord, I, I pray that those hearts would turn to you in fear if they don't know you, God, and come to faith in Christ. But Lord, if they are believers and they are genuinely born again, God, I pray that you would work faith into their heart. As Paul says in Ephesians, God, I pray that you would strengthen them in their inner man. That they, with all the saints, may, able, may be able to comprehend what is the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of the love of God. Lord, I pray that you would help us tonight to never lose sight when we're praying of, of the facts that are presented in Romans 8, 28 through the end of the chapter, Lord, that you are working all things for our good. That you have called us, you have sought us out, bought us, you, will justif you have justified us and you will glorify us. That nothing, no one can lay a charge against those who are bought and paid for by God, who are his elect, his children, his family, his sons, his daughters. It is only Christ who can condemn, yet he has given us eternal life. Lord, we ask that you help us to remember that nothing can separate us from that gift of eternal life, of love that Christ gives us. Help us to hold on to that even when it doesn't feel good, even when circumstances are screaming at us. Let us hold on to our faith. Let us not waver, but stay steadfast in hoping in Christ, in running to Christ, in coming before the very throne of God and casting our cares upon you because we know that you care for us. Lord, give us that faith. Sustain that faith in us. Help us to exercise that faith in the midst of trials, in the midst of diverse circumstances. God, give us opportunity to exercise this faith. Lord, we ask that you would continue to do the work that you started. We pray your word, God, that you, we know, God, that you began this work and that you're faithful, that you will faithfully complete it. Help us to know these things. Help us to lean on these things. Lord, help us to stay steadfastly hopeful in all situations. Help us to do, as James tells us, to count it all joy when we enter in trials, tribulation, testing of our faith. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.